And I will, I will in a moment introduce this very distinguished panel that we have been able to gather for this session here. But just to, to give some introductory remarks um, on, on this topic before introducing you. Um, effects analysis then, uh, or, or you, it's sometimes called impact assessment, cost benefits analysis, there are different terms used for, for similar procedures here. Um, what you can observe in general is this have developed in policy making and legislative processes over time. Um, this kind of effects analysis in public policy making, they can be very different. They can take the shape of full scale general equilibrium models. They can be more limited ones. It very much depends on the situation. So there is no model that fits all situations. There is, however, I think a basic common question that are trying to answer in those processes. And that is, are the benefits for society greater than the costs and other potential negative effects following, from example, change in a law or a regulation? In the area of financial reporting standard setting, we can observe a similar development as in politics and legislative processes. The ISB is a global standard setter for financial reporting. It is a due process organization work on the basis of an evidence-based approach when developing IFRSs. The ISB engages with constituents and performs field work in order to understand the effects of its standard setting. In the 2012 trustee strategy review, it was recommended that the ISB further develop an agreed methodology on effects analysis. The trustees established a consultative group to provide advice on how to assess the possible effects and how to share the results. Based on the recommendation of the group in 2014, a number of measures have been implemented in order to strengthen the impact assessment capacity of the ISP. And you can now see the results of this development manifested uh, by publishing the effects on an analysis, not at least by the three major standards that have been adopted now in near time. I'm thinking about IFRS 9, IFRS 15, and especially uh, IFRS 16 on leases now. Turn it to um, financial reporting in the EU. The EFRAG has in its role as, as the expert body advising the EU on adoption of IFRS has also performed and published effects analysis related to new and amended IFRSs. Since EFRAG, like the ISB, is a due process organization, engagement with constituents and field work has been a natural base for the impact assessment. The Maystadt report in 2013 called for EFRAC to strengthen its impact assessment capacity and also to broader scope of assessment in the light of the endorsement criteria. This has also been emphasized by the European Commission and the EU Parliament. EFRAC with its new organization has taken a number of steps to answer those requests. This is also shown now uh, in the way that uh, endorsement wise is performed and how it's published and I will ask to refer now to that we have a special section, for example, on the European public good criteria. Uh, it's still important to recognize also that the impact assessment performed by EFRAG is different in scope and in geography compared to what the ISB is doing. So, it is established, I think, that effects analysis should be performed in the process of financial reporting standard setting, both on an international and on a European level. It's also reasonable to say that there are high expectations of what can be achieved by performing such analysis. But there are also, of course, limits to what can be assessed within such procedures. Um, and I also think that this is still a work in progress. Because of this, a number of questions arise regarding the focus, the merits, and the challenges related to the effects analysis of IFRS. It is therefore my great pleasure here to introduce a very distinguished panel to discuss this topic and, and to deal with some questions attached to this very fascinating team. So let me introduce first Hans Hogerworst, uh, uh, chairman of the ISB, and also I would like to congratulate Hans to being re-elected as the chairman of the ISB for another term. Please give Hans a big hand for that. And, and before introducing the other panelists, I'd also like to raise an initial question to Hans, is that why don't the ISB celebrate its anniversary? Oh, well, at the ISB, um, we, we celebrate every day that we are still alive. Ah! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> 
Thank you for that. Uh, let me now turn to the other panelists. Uh, first of all, let me welcome from, from Australia, Chris Peach, Chairman and the CEO of the Australian Accounting Standards Board. Thank you for coming here and providing a, a truly global perspective to this. <laughs> then I also would like to introduce Eric Nottebom, who is the Acting Director of Investment and Company Reporting at DG FISMA, European Commission. Please welcome Eric. <laughs> Then we have Patrick de Cambour, who is an EFRAG fellow board member and also the president of the French Standard Set Autorité de Normes Comptables, ANC. <laughs> and last but not least, I would like to, uh, to introduce Professor Joan Kim Gassen, who is a professor of financial reporting and auditing at the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. <laughs> Please welcome me. Thank you very much. The, this session will be organized as follows. So I, I, will I will raise a number of questions to the panelists, uh, and we have some, made some preparations actually for that. Uh, but we do also have, uh, uh, in due time, if the panelists will not speak too much on the topic, which I hope they will do, but we also will have a, a Q&A with the audience that are trying to mo moderate in the best way around. Okay, fine, thank you. Well, um, Given the, the, the result of the initial poll here, that seems that the uh, vast majority thought that it was very important to uh, understand the effects of financial reporting standard setting, a natural question for the panel to open up would be first be, do you agree on that? And, and how important is then effect analysis in the standard setting process? And I, I would like to give Hans first the word to kick off on that, being, being representative of the standard setter. Well, I think it is, uh, it is important. Um, it is important already at the beginning of the standard setting that we, more than in the past, we do now some sort of a macro analysis. Is there a problem? And if there is a problem, would we be able to fix that in a reasonable uh, way? And would that be in a way that is cost eff effective? Those are questions that we, uh, in the past, perhaps, um, try to answer along the way uh, instead of at the very beginning, and that was one of the reasons why a lot of um, uh, standards uh, setting uh, stranded uh, at a certain point. And for example, if I had known, I think if the board had known what we found out at the very end with the effect analysis on leases, for example, that 85% of leases were operating leases and were off balance sheet, we had a, a, a vague feeling that a lot was being structured to be outside our balance sheet, but we didn't have precise numbers. If we had had that number from the very beginning, it would have been so much easier to convince the world of the necessity of this uh, standard. Uh, so I believe, it is, uh, I, I believe it is important, not just at the end, but uh, also at the very, uh, at the very uh, beginning. I would, however, also like to be a little bit cautious about the expectations of what we can do. Um, I think, for example, it's totally impossible. It's already impossible to calculate the macroeconomic uh, uh, effects of all standards together. I mean, I think it's very plausible that they are a big contributor to economic growth through increased uh, transparency, but how much, I would not know. Nobody can ever tell. Uh, and for individual standards to make macroeconomic uh, impact um, uh, analysis, I, I think, is, is, is extremely uh, difficult. So I think much of the effect analysis will remain uh, qualitative. I also want to say one thing about um, accounting and stability, accounting standards and stability, and it's one of the European um, uh, demands that, that uh, accounting standards should not damage uh, financial or stu contribute to financial stability. I am firmly convinced that good accounting contributes to long-term stability. It allows companies to identify problems at an early stage and fix them at, at an early stage and then uh, reach stability over, over, uh, over time. I do not, of all too often, financial stability requirement is equated with standards that do not lead to the volatility. That, I think, is the wrong uh, answer because short-term volatility can be very real. It can reflect economic reality, and you need to see it and to uh, uh, so enable to address it at an early stage so that big spikes in volatility do not occur later. 
good example is the expected loss model, which is following up the, uh, current the, 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 the incurred loss model. The incurred loss model allows banks to disregard uh, changes in their credit situation for a very long time. They have a lot of short-term stability until it become, the problem becomes so big that all losses need to be taken at, uh, at the same time, and then you get a huge spike in volatility. So sometimes you need to face economic reality and, and um, live with a little bit of short-term volatility in order to be able to address problems and create long-term stability. Eric, if you turn down to, to the European Commission, what is view on that? Well, I, I think that uh, impact analysis is crucially important for the credibility of the standards which are being set and that it should be taken up from the very start of developing uh, standards because at the end it should lead to evidence-based uh, policy decisions. And uh, so far that has been lacking to a certain extent in the setting of accounting standards because it was felt to be a rather technical exercise to be carried out by technicians. But as we have learned in the financial crisis, accounting standards can play a major role in investor protection, in uh, building up confidence uh, by investors and consumers on the financial markets. So it is crucially important that when standards are developed, that there is due process, that the possible impact of the standard is assessed in a serious way, because it will also help to, to, to come to the best possible results. Now, we in the Commission have a long-standing experience on impact uh, analysis. Uh, every piece of legislation which leaves our house has been impact assessed in a very serious manner. And uh, we expect and hope that a similar approach will apply in the future. And it is already being applied by ISB as well as by ourselves when we endorse uh, standards. Now, uh, what we have learned is that, especially at the very beginning of the process, it's very important to define the problem. What problem do you intend to tackle with the new standard? Uh, and uh, therefore, it is very important to have that definition clear, what is the issue. And we are also used in the Commission then to, once we have defined the problem, to develop certain options to tackle the issue. And each option should be assessed on a cost-benefit analysis on the pros and the cons and what the uh, end result will be. Um, starting from the baseline scenario, it's a baseline scenario in the Commission, uh, you would make a good career and you would be very popular some 10, 15 years ago if after you had defined the problem, your policy advice after having gone through the options would be uh, let's stick to the basic scenario because any change may worsen things rather than improve things. That was in, uh, there was a period in the Commission where this was the best possible option, not to legislate more. Uh, today that is not necessarily any longer the case, although we have lowered our legislative agenda significantly. Uh, but if there are real problems, they should be tackled. That is for sure. First you compare, is the baseline scenario sufficient to tackle the issues or do we need an improvement? Therefore, the options are necessary. Now, in accounting, uh, we at the Commission are in a bit of a special situation, as is EFRAC, because the standards are not developed by the Commission or by EFRAC, they are developed by our friends from the IFRS Foundation. So, in our view, that puts a heavy responsibility to, to start with on the IASB, because the IASB has the option to define the problem, and they have the possibility to also elaborate different options, and then to select the best possible option as the future standard. Subsequently, it is up to the Commission for the European markets, together with EFRAC, to assess not whether there are other options possible, but we have only two choices in our impact assessment. That is, either to endorse the standard or to reject the standard. So that means either to stick to the baseline scenario, which is we keep where we are because we think it's the best option, or we move to the endorsement of the standard, which is the only other option. And that means that the impact assessment at the uh, European level will be much more focused on the question whether the standard is good for Europe or not. And I think that's a huge challenge because, as we know, ISB takes a global approach on standard setting, so also their impact assessment work will be based on global issues, on the sort of common denominator of the global world in the financial sectors, whereas we at the Commission will take a second look in our impact assessment uh, whether or not the standard is good for Europe or not. And I think that's a very big challenge. Therefore, it's extremely important that uh, our EFRAC uh, colleagues uh, are very much involved from the very start of the process in ISB up to the very end of the process so don't we, that we don't end up with different impact assessments with different results. That is crucially important that we stay together 
because as you know, uh, we at the Commission firmly believe in global standard setting. We firmly believe that we should uh, endorse and stay at a global standard setting uh, sort of scenario, and we by, by no means intend to develop European standards for Europe only. That is not a good thing for financial markets and uh, globally operating companies. So we have very high expectations. Uh, we have uh, launched a discussion at the monitoring board of the IFRS Foundation on impact assessment. And we're very happy that the members of the board and also the trustees of the foundation have shown an openness and readiness to discuss this impact assessment methodology as one of the key issues for the year to come. Uh, and we have also engaged uh, with EFRAC in a very uh, constructive and very good discussion on how to develop uh, an EU methodology for impact assessing standards. Uh, we have seen from ISB for the leasing standard that they can do a very good job on this. And we will also show that we can do a very good job for the endorsement process of IFRS 16. So I hope that uh, we will be able to show you the excellent outcome of all these new uh, ch uh, challenges we are facing, so to say, in the standard setting within the year to come. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the standard here, IFRS 16 leases, has now been mentioned here a couple of times already, and, and it's quite clear that the impact assessment that has been performed by the ISB is very, very comprehensive on, on a global scale here. So uh, a follow-up question is that, what, what, can we, what do you think we can learn from the ISB effects analysis on IFRS 16? What is there something to take away from that standard? Maybe Patrick, you would like to kick off on that question? Um, so uh, wh what can we learn? Um, I if I wanted to put that in a nutshell, I would say, first of all, we, learn, we can learn how to be on the right track to evaluate and stop being over-emotional, over-subjective and try to introduce as much objectivity as possible in assessing the impact of a standard. The second uh, key takeaway is obviously that it is difficult. It's not easy and that there is a cost to it. Uh, because it represents a serious uh, uh, time effort and uh, energy is needed. And finally, maybe from a more global perspective, that uh, a good effect analysis cannot be a miracle solution because there are other points to be taken into account. Now, if I drill down a little bit in the details of that uh, very summarized uh, judgment, I would say that, first of all, we have to pay tribute to the ISB to have tried uh, to, to have developed such a significant effort uh, on IFRS 16, which tried to respond to the previous criticism in terms of impact assessment that had been, um, that had been uh, uh, issued by a number of stakeholders. So for those who have not yet read this document, it's a uh, a little more than 100 pages of quality literature, which is good to read. So I suggest that, uh, and it gives a, a rather comprehensive, you mentioned it, class, uh, perspective, not perfect, of course, but a, 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 a comprehensive perspective on the key questions. Uh, I think that the key merit is that it, it establishes a methodology and proposes a general structure, of course, it may vary from one standard to the other, but on the other hand, it's a good pattern. And, and I think uh, there is some fuel for thought in that for everybody. Uh, both the methodology and the structure of the reporting, uh, of reporting on the impact assessments are helpful for the standard itself, but more important in general and for the future. It certainly creates a reference. You mentioned uh, in one of your papers, is it a benchmark? I'm, I'm not sure I like benchmarks because it's too much of a, you know, put something on a pedestal. I don't think, uh, but it's, it certainly is a good reference. Uh, because, uh, of course, the impact assessment on IFRS 16 is trying to address and does address the key questions in line with the objectives of uh, a new standards in an ISB context, i.e. the two key questions where does it improve the allocation of capital? And does it bring the benefits for better decision making, which are the underlying questions? And I think 
that uh, you, when you read the document, you see that the, uh, they are trying very hard to answer the questions. It's not always easy, and the answer is not always straightforward. But on the other hand, there is a good try. You mentioned it. It does not address the macroeconomic and financial stability perspective. And this is probably one of the challenges that we at EFRAG will have to try to, we will have to face because this is a point that has been asked from EFRAG. Not easy, quite frankly. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that just uh, assessing a standard by the impact on capital allocation or benefits for better decision making is sufficient. I think, I'm personally convinced that you need to go further. Now, is it easy? I'm not sure. Uh, what else have we learned in very, very quickly? It's a reasonable mix of quantitative and qualitative assessment in this case. Uh, by the way, it was, I wouldn't say it was an easy case, but it was an easier case than others because the quantitative uh, information was available to a certain extent and therefore it was possible to elaborate around that. It's not always the case. Uh, and frankly, I, 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 I remember vividly IFRS 9 where some uh, a real uh, impact data would have been uh, more than welcome, but it was very, e very, very difficult to, to gather. Uh, it was also a good mix between, you know, general assessment and sectorial assessment and also illustrative examples, which is a good way. And I think the way that is envisaged for IFRS 4 phase 2 which is to go to some key testing is a good idea because having a broad information on such a standard would be, in my view, very difficult. However, going live without testing would be uh, probably dangerous. Um, of course, one of the key difficulties is, and, and we hear that from businesses it's very difficult to measure the cost of implementation because you know how, how much will the systems have to change? Uh, what would be the cost of education and communication? Is it really simple to implement or is it over sophisticated? So that's a key question. And by the way, the methodology to get the answer to that one is not easy because uh, you can act you can have a test on the number of companies, but it's not easy. So when we'll drill down further, I think the cost of implementation is difficult. To That's one of the lessons. And of course, the cost itself of conducting an impact assessment is a serious question. And by the way, I'm, I'm just saying this in the interest of the EFRAG budget. Uh, <laughs> having the chairman here, uh, having resources is, 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 a, key, is a key point. And we, we can't, and, and also a good cooperation with the people that have the data. I'm, t I'm thinking about the observers in particular. Hans, any, any further thoughts on this you already touched oh, upon? I can only say we really enjoyed making the uh, effect analysis. It was the first time we did it in such an elaborate way. We knew it was uh, very important given the sensitivity of the standard. Not everybody is happy with the, with the standard, so we knew we had to do a serious job. And, um, and, and, and I believe we, 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 we did a good job uh, uh, demonstrating the, uh, the need for this, uh, for this standard. It is not true that we don't say anything about economic impact or financial stability. We are just very cautious because there's not all that much you can say. Uh, I, I'm absolutely convinced that no, if you hire a company or a, a consultancy that is going to uh, calculate the macroeconomic effect, the, the, well, I don't think they would be doing a good job. What we said is it's, it will certainly lead to better decision making around the, the, the question, are we going to lease or are we going to buy and borrow? Uh, that's uh, the distinction is uh, management will have a much clearer perspective uh, on that. So it will lead to better capital allocation and that should contribute to economic growth. N not, I mean, I'm not going to pretend it's going to be a huge uh, uh, 
contribute to economic growth, but the, as far it has, as it has an impact, it will be uh, positive. I'm absolutely sure about that. I think we've made that plausible. <coughs> and I don't think anybody else can come to wildly different or more precise uh, uh, co conclusions. I also believe it will be it will contribute to financial stability since the investor will have more insight into the true uh, leverage of, of uh, companies. Now, we're not talking about insurance companies or, or uh, banks, so they're not at the heart of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, financial uh, system. So again, here, I don't think it will be a huge step towards more stability in the financial markets. That would be preposterous to say that. But I do think that any every uh, um, st little step towards better insight in, in leverage in the economy is, is should contribute to financial stability. Little step, but an important step. Thank you very much. Um, interesting. I think we have some, some, some opinions here that might go in different directions. Um, and we're going to drill down on that uh, also later in the session. But a, a, a very basic and very <laughs> wide question that was touched upon in, in the introduction here is that at, at what level should or, or could effects or impacts be assessed? So we're talking here about the individual standard level or about the whole package, the IFRS in general. I think this is a very basic and key question. And I would like to, to Chris maybe to, to kick off on that question. Thank you. Uh, so I did just want to start off by saying as a fellow standard setter who was also subject to legislative requirements about regulatory impact statements, I can only empathise with what you're going through in trying to come up with your processes and procedures to do that. So good luck. Um, having said that, uh, it is just absolutely critically important that it's not just ass assessed at the individual standard level. So I think we heard very well from our uh, keynote speaker before and also from Hans that each of these standards is actually part of a whole framework. And the reason why we went into this whole framework at the beginning was for a number of very good reasons. So I think it's worthwhile just pointing out what those are again. So one, it's the comparability and transparency of having everybody doing the same thing, a global set of standards that are actually contributing to global capital markets. We've also heard some evidence that that's actually been effective, that there's actually been an impact on the cost of capital and there's been benefits of actually doing that. And I guess what I come back to is, certainly from an Australian perspective, as a very small country at basically the bottom of the world, nobody cares about Australian accounting standards. But if we're out there saying we're doing IFRS, people understand. They know how to look at an, a set of financial statements that comes from an Australian company. And that's effectively what you've done here in Europe. So my comment to you is to make sure that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's very important to assess at an individual standards level. So, you know, the key for me is I think Eric's comments that standard setting is a form of regulation. And I think as standard setters, we have to understand that. So there are consequences. We can't just be sitting there thinking that we can willy-nilly introduce new requirements. There is a cost. So we do need to make sure that the actual benefits outweigh those costs. But again, it's being part of that whole picture and making sure that we're not just focusing on that individual standard. Does that mean that always in Australia we're just going to automatically endorse every single thing that comes out from the ISB? No, we, we still have to stop and make those assessments. We also, like you, have to do a cost calculation at a standard level. But we also have the opportunity to do a regulatory impact statement which looks at that bigger picture. So in Australia, we call it the nuclear option. So if we were going to not endorse a particular standard, it has to be for a fundamentally, incredibly bad standard. Or more likely, it would be an accumulation of standards that we felt were not actually adding up to a decent package. And I think the way we would want to be tackling this is that we don't want to be making that assessment at the end. It's up to us on the way through to be influencing and making sure that we get a standard that we're actually happy with. And I think some of that comes about, you know, some of our concerns come about because of compromise as standards are developed. And that's just natural. I think probably the biggest thing I've found out about accounting standards is they are incredibly political. 
And that was certainly not something that I had anticipated when I took on the chair role 18 months ago. So I think we have to be realistic about what accounting standards can actually achieve. The other thing I would also just point out is uh, you've heard some very good comments about um, the impact of moving to IFRS and that generally that was positive. We've also been doing some work in Australia about uh, the implementation of IFRS and how well that's gone. I think it's fair to say that IFRS, unfortunately, Hans, is not well loved, but nobody's actually seen an alternative. So all I can really say again is that it's so important to look at both levels. It's not just the standard level, but it's also looking at the impact on the overall framework as well. Thank you, Chris. Um, Joachim, uh, from an academic point of view, what, what, what would be your perspective of, on, on this, the whole package versus the individual standards? Um, yeah, f well, thanks for having me. Um, so first, I, I, I think it depends on what you want to measure. So if you, if you think about the overall, let's say, public good, then this is something that clearly you cannot measure on a single standard basis. Then again, it's really hard to, to link whatever you know, macro outcome to, uh, let's say, accounting per se. We've seen this in the whole literature on IFRS adoption effects, that with all the concurrent changes which were happening around the same time, it's more that we change from one large regime to another large regime. And this, this has accounting standards, this has enforcement, this has changes on the capital market, even down to the trading mechanisms, all happening more or less at the same time, and what we can say is that all this together had, an, had had an effect on liquidity or cost of capital or whatnot. So if you're interested in understanding whether IFRS 16 is a way forward, for example, then most likely you can't do this by looking at cost of capital or something like this. But what you can do, obviously, you can look at, you know, how, does, how, does, how do lease contracts react? So is there a change in the lease industry once adopted? Do, they, do we see new contracts? This is something where you can actually look at a single standard and do a meaningful analysis. So does this help us to understand the effect on the public good? I'm not so sure. So it, it, it might help us to understand the mechanism well and to ask smarter questions. So for example, if we see that post IFRS 16, there is a change in the type of lease arrangements that are being negotiated, then the a direct question from this is, if this is driven by IFRS 16, maybe we should look into the question whether these lease contracts are efficient the way they are, whether they help the economy, or whether maybe, you know, I don't want to be the devil's advocate here, but maybe they make things worse. Maybe they become more intransparent. And then this would be a time to take a step back and think, well, maybe, maybe we can do something to the accounting again to, to, to avoid this unintended consequence, if you want. So in short, my answer will be, it depends on whether you are interested in a large scale outcome measure, then you would have to look at the complete package and this might even w be wider than just, just financial accounting. If you're, if, you're looking in, if you're interested in a very specific outcome measure, then the standard level would be nice. And of course, when it comes to cost of implementation, I think there are also direct questions that you can ask at the standard level. So, so which firms do have have to change their reporting structures. So what kind of costs are involved there? This is, these are also questions that sometimes you can ask at the standard level. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone in the audience that have a, a view or, or a question regarding this issue about standard or, or individual? Yes, please. Please introduce yourself also yeah, briefly. Yeah. Carsten Zielke, a former tech member, independent user. Uh, I just wondered why these impact analysis are done in the end, not why after the exposure draft, because then we still have time in order to contribute a little bit the outcome of the effects into the discussions before uh, having to say whether this uh, standard uh, can be adopted and translated into <coughs> European law or not. Anyone who wants to comment on that? Maybe I can say one yeah, of these. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, please. Um, so obviously, oh, so obviously, we would like to uh, see effect analysis as early in the game as possible. But if you if you take a step back back and think about what is an effect analysis, then uh, then you can you think about medicine for example. You have to have a drug in order to test it. 
Okay, so you can you can do early stage research, and that will be similar to running experiments, right? So you could say, okay, we have a new idea about uh, this new leasing standard, and we pilot it with a uh, let's say with a bunch of firms and see how this goes, right? So a, I'm not so sure whether it's easy to get these firms to pilot, and b, um, of course, it's not the same thing. If you if you pilot with some firms that choose the new leasing standard it's not that likely that the leasing industry will customize new lease contracts for these very few pilot firms. So some things, in the sense of a true effect analysis, can only be evaluated once, we, once, when, once these things get implemented. But this does not mean that we cannot do research prior to you know, starting a new standard. So, but this, from a, from a technical point of view, this is not really an effect analysis. This is more an estimation of, of potential mechanisms which might trigger an effect. Yeah, but this is also needed. So we need to think about potential effects that something can have on an ex ante basis, yeah, on a theoretical basis, and then form predictions. But in the end, the question about an effect is an empirical question. So in the end, what we, ha what we want to measure is something that we need to observe in data. And why we can do this in the lab or in a field experiment. In case of accounting, where we have all these network effects going on, the ultimate evidence is being produced in the wild, which also makes assessment so super hard. And yes. well, of course, during the whole cre standard setting process, we have so many moments of communication with uh, stakeholders. Uh, no lack of communication with the lease industry who have predicted the end of the world numerous times uh, and n also have come up with reasonable arguments that we had to uh, that that we had to uh, look at so we have certainly made a lot of partial analyses of of possible effects of of the standard and have adjusted our standards uh, to 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 those uh, possibilities um, but it is true as Joachim says that you know you th th the standard needs to uh, have stopped being a moving target uh, before uh, being able to do a full-fledged effect analysis. But most of the issues have already been considered. Okay, thank you. Uh, <coughs> you talked about here uh, about uh, there is a challenge to assess costs and benefits of county changes. Let's put a more specific question to that. Can they be quantified and how then? Uh, Patrick, you, you mentioned this earlier that the, in, in the field of IFRS 16, well, it's a challenge. So could you, would you like to develop that also a little bit on, on that theme? Uh, Klaas, uh, I'll try. Um, uh, benefits and costs. I had a look again at the IFRS 16 uh, effect analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, I, if I go step by step on what was uh, assessed, in terms of benefits, what was assessed, first of all, was the improved quality of financial reporting for users and for preparers. And quite frankly, on this, it's not always possible, but if data is available, in the case of leases, it roughly was, then you can quantify. You can probably quantify and show the balance sheet uh, uh, as it would look like if you apply IFRS 16, which and also have a view over the income statement and the impact on EBDA and everything. So, so in that respect, improved quality of financial reporting, I think, yes, in certain cases you can quantify it. On IFRS 9, I think it was not possible, quite frankly. I was personally... Uh, not happy to read in the press once we had finished our IFRAG system that someone in a bank had uh, made some sort of a mm, rough evaluation of what would be the impact of the new impairment of, uh, uh, of uh, po po policies. Okay, but that was so uh, such an estimate that it was not something we could have probably taken into account. And quite frankly, it was, a, it was a, a very difficult because it, it implied so many changes in systems uh, that at the end of the day, you need to rely almost on the P, uh, PI, uh, P, uh, post implementation review at the end of the day to see if your assumptions in terms of impact 
are right. Second point on benefits is the improved comparability. Well, quite frankly, uh, on this one, you do not really need to quantify. If you don't have too many options, which is an issue in, in certain standards, if you don't have too many options, you probably generate comparability. In cost on costs, I mentioned the fact that it is, in my view, pretty difficult to measure the cost uh, of implementation in companies. And even, even so, well, IFRS 9 is topical to a certain extent because it implies so many uh, significant changes in the system, but which, which were anyway required by the prudential regulations somehow. So for me, what is important is to make sure that we have one modification and possibly not two. One for prudential reasons and the other one for accounting reasons. Because operating several systems, unless they are highly connected, is a cost and, it, and is an ongoing cost. So in the case of IFRS 16, what is mentioned is that the, co the initial cost, there is a cost, but it's not very significant because the portfolio, it's a restricted area, quite frankly. Leases you can address, you can make an inventory, you can uh, uh, simulate and get proper figures. When you address a pervasive standard that addresses all transactions, it becomes more difficult. Other effects are, are difficult to quantify. The cost of borrowing, uh, the covenants, the impact of covenants becomes very qualitative. Uh, one, one point which has to be addressed in my view is the regulatory capital requirement because this one can be quantified. If you can quantify the impact on balance sheet, you can quantify the impact on the regulatory re capital requirements. And I mentioned a number of times to the regulators that I felt they should consider where if we increase the level of provisioning, how is it addressed in the prudential reporting? Because you can't have double counting on this one. So quantification, part of it, not always, and you have to rely a lot on qualitative, but of course qualitative is not a, a dirty word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Joachim, uh, you want, uh, we yeah. want to add something. Yeah, first, and then Eric. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Good. Um, so I, I, have, I have a slightly different view than Patrick, but that's I think this, this <laughs> is, yeah, that should be fun for everybody. So um, <laughs> the, the first thing when it comes to, uh, when it comes to quantifying, uh, it's obviously it's hard. I think we are all in agreement. When you, when you think about the three dimensions that we can talk about, then this would be transparency, comparability, and cost. So transparency and comparability both are benefit arguments, right? And cost, obviously, is a cost argument. So transparency is, is very similar to what you label financial reporting quality. For, the, for me, this is extremely hard to assess because all the different users use financial statements in a different way. So we can say something you know, has become on, is, is on balance now, but maybe this had, ha, has had an effect on disclosure notes or whatever, and now, now things are new to the reader and the reader has a hard time understanding it, and so on. So sometimes it's hard to really assess the transparency effect. And I think we as researchers are to blame here because we jump to second order effects like liquidity, cost of capital, way too soon. So we, we didn't work hard enough on understanding how investors actually use this new information. Instead, we, we took the cheap ticket out and just looked at market consequences because these are easy to collect, right? So I think transparency, to assess transparency effects and to quantify them, that's really hard. <coughs> Comparability, you said maybe we don't have to quantify this because it's more or less obvious uh, that there is a comparability effect. And while I see your point, I think one thing, we shouldn't forget one thing, and, and, and personally I've done some research on this, uh, there is this nasty little detail called compliance. So sometimes we have, you know, we, we, we try to establish comparable standards or we even have homogeneous standards across countries. But for whatever reason, Italian disclosures about pension liabilities still look different from German disclosures about pension liabilities, right? And, and all of a sudden in German firms, there's still this little note that, that our depreciation is oriented at tax Oops. Mm. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there is, you know, there compliance issues might be there, and I think they're important for standard setters to know. So, it's I think quantifying comparability effects can be interesting. Now, now turning to cost, 
Obviously, cost seem is hard to measure, like everything, but for cost, at least in principle, we could collect direct data. So for me as a researcher, I'm really ashamed that we don't have more studies about direct cost because of course we could try survey firms about their estimates about how costly it is to implement a new standard. We could, and this is one thing, for example, for the auditors in the room, so you all have your IFRS help desks around the globe. It would be very interesting to understand what are the frequently asked questions to these help desks. So do they getting regular phone calls complaining about, I don't know how to implement this new whatever, you know, this paragraph really gives me headaches. So if we could collect this data, that would be relative clean, that would be relatively clean measures about direct costs. So people staying up late at night trying to understand how to adopt this certain standard. That would be a direct measure. So I think there is some stuff that we can do if we just pool our resources. This data for researchers like us, this data is simply not available. We can lobby, but it's not that easy. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Eric. Yes, just yeah. a couple of comments, if yeah. you like, on the yeah. base of what yeah. has just yeah. been said by the several uh, uh, statements. Um, first of all, uh, impact assessments, uh, since it is about evidence-based decision-making, it should be uh, carried out at the very beginning of the decision-making process. It cannot be that you develop a standard, endorse it, and then start drafting uh, the justification and the evidence. So, uh, at, as I said at my very first intervention, the idea is first you define the problem, then you check whether the existing situation is sufficient to tackle that problem, or whether options are available to do better. Uh, and it is not like uh, what has been done uh, dozens of years ago. First you draft your decision, and then you start drafting the justification. So this is a different model. So you have to start with the impact assessment. Now, yeah, of course, this is a huge challenge, and it is not an easy task. And also, as, as uh, Patrick says, there are many unknown factors, especially on the benefits side. Cost calculations can be done, most likely. It will be much more difficult to give a clear impact assessment of the possible benefits, which often depend very much on behavior on markets. And it's always very difficult to find hard evidence how companies will behave when the new standard comes into force. There are many allegations made, but the proof is in the pudding. You will only know what it has brought about on behavior after the standard has been put into place. We at the Commission very often are faced with this kind of issues. And therefore, how we tackle these issues is to do our best efforts we can do to find good arguments in literature, in research, in context with stakeholders to make our best guess in such cases. And that is the least you should do as a regulator. It also means that impact assessment ex ante is not the whole story of good and better regulation. It's only part of the story. The other element, the, the complement, is that you should also do a good ex post evaluation. Has the standard achieved its objectives? Has it, have we done the, made the right choices? You should always build in a moment after the adoption of the standards to test whether indeed the objectives, as defined in the impact assessment, have been achieved. So mm -hmm. the one is necessarily combined with the other, and that's very important also. Uh, we haven't, as a commission, uh, made too much initiatives yet on that, but we in the commission certainly always do ex post evaluation mm -hmm. to see whether we have reached our targets, and I think in accounting setting, we should also move to a similar model. But we that is an other story. Uh, we, we have a regular post implementation review after two or three years. Oh yeah, so perfect. So voilà. yeah. Yeah, but I just want to say it's not yeah. only about ex ante, but it's yeah, very it's uh, important ex because yeah. if you don't do any ex post evaluation, your ex ante impact mm -hmm. assessment is hanging somewhere in the air, and everybody will put it in the poubelle, uh, in the in the. Uh, what is the English word again? In the basket. <laughs> uh, happy that the work has been done and then we move on. No, the story is not over. You have to uh, assess uh, the impact it has had in reality. Uh, my last uh, comment on this is that, um, of course, uh, we should not overestimate neither, uh, when we talk about impact assessment, uh, what we should assess. What is an accounting standard about? An accounting standard is, in principle, to create transparency uh, to, pro to ensure that investors get a clear picture, that they have confidence. Accounting standards per se are not there to create more jobs or to increase the GPD of a country. They may contribute, but they are not the main instruments to achieve these uh, goals, the much broader economic, macroeconomic goals. 
So if we talk about impact assessment, uh, the elements which should be impact assessed should relate very much to the heart of the accounting setting business. And that is very important to keep in mind so that we do not overdo the whole issue by putting impossible requests on standard setters to evaluate the possible future impact of an accounting standard. For let's face it, we all here in this room think that account standards are the most important things in the world, maybe, Somewhere. apart from the European soccer championship taking place in France today. Uh, but there are, of course, much broader and higher goals. And when we do impact assessment, we should keep that always in mind. Um, and that means uh, that, for example, the effects on financial stability, on competitiveness, uh, and similar issues on competition, uh, I think that the main issue is to be reassured that the standard will in any case not have a negative impact on financial stability, that it will not be damaging for competition or against any European interest. That is the starting point and probably also close to the, to the finish line. It's impossible to uh, impact assess whether a standard, and it's also not in line, I think, with the basic idea of standard setting, to prove that a standard will enhance uh, growth and create jobs or improve financial stability necessarily. And that is something we should keep in mind. We should not over-dramatize uh, the concept of impact assessment. Chris, um, please. Just wanted to quickly pick up on a couple of comments. Mm. I, I think certainly key benefits are comparability and transparency, but uh, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that also sometimes accounting standards actually help us better manage because we're actually measuring something that we haven't previously done before. So a couple of quick things that I can think about, and Hans touched on leases as one of those, but certainly defined benefits. There certainly was a radical change in treatment of defined benefit plans in Australia as soon as those funds came onto balance sheet because they were actually being managed appropriately going forward. So, so again, it just illustrates it's very hard to get your head around how to measure the benefits. It's much easier to get your head around how much the costs are going to be. That's why it's also so important that defined, pen, defined benefit pension schemes get on the balance sheet of government. Absolutely. Then they might. <laughs> <laughs> Not least because you're paying. Mm. No, but it, it's, 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 I, I, I just gave a speech in Lisbon and I based myself on, because there are no hard data uh, uh, available, but the only, um, the only uh, research I found indicated that there is 70, among just OCD uh, countries, there is 72 trillion in unfunded li uh, pension liabilities. One thing is for sure, on top of all the debt, that's, that's more than that recognized debt of the same uh, government. So one thing is for sure, these liabilities are never going to be paid as they have been promised. It's just too much, but it's not being managed because it's not visible. We have been talking about evidence-based standard setting uh, and we have evidence-based organizations here. And then a key question is, of course, what, what are the challenges in obtaining evidence on effects then of new standards before implementation, the ex ante situation then? And, and how can they be overcome in that sense? To guard it? Because evidence is so important here when we, we talk about standard setting. Joachim, would you like to kick off on that? Yeah. So. Uh, I think there is one thing which is important to mention here. When we talk about ex ante evidence, then I think we, what we are talking about is, is really more an impact assessment kind of analysis. So what we are looking at is we try to understand theoretically or based on prior work how in a standard will affect eventually uh, a, certain, a certain outcome. So I think it's important to understand that this is not, this is not evidence because what we when we talk about evidence, evidence is empirical, so it has to be measured. So what we, when we're talking about impact analysis, then we, we try to predict ex ante what is going to happen. And of course, this is informative, but this can, brutally, this can be brutally wrong. Yeah? And, and there's only, there's only one, one point I want to make in this respect is, I think as accountants, we, for a long time, we haven't really thought about how our recipients use our information. So we, we were always silently assuming that our investors will use all the information available in a rational, predictable way. We just did an interview study with, with the help of ICAS and IFREC, uh, by the way, thanks again. Mark is also in the audience. We interviewed 82 professional investors. 
some of them really big buy side investors, yeah, um, handling your your pension money. And I and I have to tell you that it's not it's not that they they are all smart, right? But it's not that they use financial accounting information like we think they should be using it. And we had people telling us if it's not on Bloomberg, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so it is. It is something that to keep in mind. So, and, and when we do ex ante assessments of potential effects that will materialize later, I think we have to think about the people that will be using this information. And we have to try to understand how they will use it. And I think we have to uh, accept that financial accounting is about communication. And only if we reach our recipient, we can have an effect. And, and, and understanding this better will also help in the ex ante assessments, I guess. Chris. Um, so I might just bring in a couple of more pragmatic considerations that we've come across. So the, the key thing is that uh, preparers and users are not always following these standards as closely as what we as standard setters are. So actually trying to get them to focus their attention and think about what the implications are going to be is actually quite challenging. So that's even on the cost side where you're actually more likely to get s some decent information. The, the other thing that we have found is that it's difficult to work out what the incremental costs are because quite often companies, entities will save up these changes and make a whole raft of systems changes at the same time. So it's often quite difficult to just pinpoint, well, did they really do it because 16 came in or did they actually do it because there was some regulatory requirement from... Um, capital basis that they needed to do that as well. The other thing is, the other difficult thing is that costs tend to be immediate. And so people can get their heads around those, but the benefits tend to come across a longer period of time. So again, it's just that much harder to actually really be fair about how you uh, bring those two concepts together and make sure you're comparing apples and, or and apples, not apples and oranges. So a couple of things that we've also found out that you can sort of introduce is how much of a reduction there is in preparers' time, a little bit because of Joachim's question about how, how much is being asked of the IFRS desks uh, around the world. So basically, if a standard's done its job, then it should have actually simplified the accounting requirements and actually make it easier for people to implement. I'm not sure I'll ask about how people's views are on IFRS 9, though. Uh, but you also asked how you can overcome some of these no, things. No. So uh, what we found is that it's important to come up with a really rigorous, rigorous methodology and that it's also important to stratify. So even if you think about listed companies, you've got some companies are going to have a high, there'll be a high impact, some there'll be moderate, some there'll be low. So it's how, how are you going to actually stratify because you can't just go out and say in Globo, it's going to cost this much. So it's important to think about those things up front when you're looking at that methodology. And if you do that well, you should find that that actually helps you across all of the standards that you're going to have to assess. So my tip would be think about it early and make sure that you've really worked on that because it's much harder to come back later and so we need to get the extra information. And the other thing I would say is it is early consultation, so it's picking up on that point. You do actually have to start the process very early in the piece, even if all you're trying to do is just collect the costs. But it can be done. Thank you very much. Any, any of the other panellists that want to, to make some observation on this? Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, have, we have time for, for a couple of questions or, or views from the audience. So is there anyone in the audience who would like to pick up on any of the themes that we have discussed here today? Uh, raise a question to the panel. Peter Malmquist. My name is Peter Malmquist and I'm a financial analyst. You will have to hear more from me later. <laughs> I just want to comment upon your remark that if it's not on Bloomberg, it kind of doesn't exist. I it's like this, being a financial analyst. If you are a sell-side analyst working on a bank, your job is to dig in deep into the figures. And sometimes they do. 
if you are a buy-side analyst, you rely on the sell-side analyst. And the sell-side analyst might end up at Bloomberg's also because they employ very skillful people. So when you say Bloomberg like it was just another news agency, it's actually very qualified analysis that they do. And if you have a portfolio of, let's say, 200 companies, there's no way you can dig into more than a couple of them. So you have to rely on a second source. And that also comes into the picture that we are using a lot of computer databases also. So not only do we need footnotes in the annual report, we actually need information on the face of the balance sheet, on the face of the income statement in certain circumstances. So it's a little bit more complicated being an analyst than just looking at Bloomberg's. <laughs> Thank, uh, thank, so thank you for that insight. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in that case, I would like to give. I yes, I like to. Hans. Peter got me uh, thinking as, as 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 usual. Bloomberg is very important. Um, a lot of hedge funds, uh, investors, start with rough analyses using uh, consuming e electronic data. And you, ha you cannot start a, a, a huge research by digging into the paper financial statements of every company. You look for outliers and then you work further. So it is imp very important what Bloomberg does. Um, and that is why one of the reasons why we feel a lot of the data that Bloomberg presents are not official IFRS data because we do so little in the way of formatting of, e taxonomy. for example, the economy yeah. and the taxonomy is probably also not fully developed uh, yet. And that's why we feel we really have to do uh, work, wi uh, work here. I think we have to look very carefully about what these people at Bloomberg and other, other uh, data aggregators uh, do, how they disseminate uh, information. I am sure they do a professionally a very good job. They make a lot of money. They can only make a lot of money by um, doing a good, uh, doing a good uh, job. So I think we can learn from them. And we can also uh, learn, fr uh, we have to be more aware of how financial information is being consumed and if we have enough grip on it. Uh, yeah, there is too much non-GAAP going around, but that's, that, that is partly because uh, companies simply have the tendency to present the numbers in a nicer way than they really are, but it is also because we do not provide enough format in the income statement. So these are two challenges I think we have to meet, and, 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 and that's why I believe it's very important that we look very carefully at these data aggregators because they do employ a lot of smart people. And so the best job you could do is to standardize the format which IFRS numbers are presented to the outside world and to eliminate options so that, that we really can compare the numbers. Then IFRS will be accepted by all investors and also by Bloomberg. That is also a long-term goal, yes. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, we have t time for maybe one or two other questions. Any other questions? Okay, any final observations from the panel that you would like to do after in this session? Well, I hope that if you go, I think you go to another vote, no, in a minute, that I hope that everybody will vote <laughs> very, very important. My English is reasonably good. What is the difference between very and quite important? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought they were the I same. Was, I was was like like <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, we now go back to the poll, actually, and the, f the final poll here is, surprise, surprise, actually, the same question that was asked in the beginning of this session, and we will now test what this session has brought to your understanding and your knowledge of this very important topic. And the question is then, how important is um, uh, standards uh, effects analysis for standard setters, <laughs> public authorities, and other stakeholders? Very important, A. Quite important, B. C, not important at all. You may now vote. Have you now all voted? 
And now I'm extremely interested to view the result. The results, please, from the European Union. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> well... No, not important as reduced. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, that is true. <laughs> That was certainly, I can see a significant change here from the initial <laughs> poll here, and that will have certainly be taken away to be analyzed further in the future. By having that's said that, the impact analysis that's, an, the that's an impact panel. analysis yeah. in itself, yeah. is that will have to be performed by somebody. <laughs> having said that, I would like to thank the panel for participating in this very interesting discussion. I'd like to suggest that we give the panel a big hand. <laughs> thank you very much.